am decently surprised at how many people watch my reaction to part one of this series. And this isn't to disrespect the guy that made this video. I think this video is very well thought out. It's very well put together. And all I'm doing is basically reacting and just saying true to what this guy's opinion of SAO Bridge is better than SAO. I don't understand the entertainment value you get from it. I, I personally, I think these reactions are fucking mid, right? Not again, again, not because this video is bad, but because I just think that reacting to video essays, you know, dissecting, you know, the SAO and SAO bridge is like, eh, but y'all want to keep eating it. I'll fucking feed you more. Let's begin part two. I'm a sucker for a good love story, but the fact that it has to be a good love story. Re why, why, why is this fish actually called a sucker? Or is he implying something else here that he does things with this fish? That, uh, you know. <laughs> really hampers my ability to enjoy the majority of anime romance. Romantic relationships are difficult to portray well in any medium, but anime in particular has a long-standing... Wait a minute! This, this picture right here, top right corner. Is this not the anime with the girl with the fucking trombone? Hibike something? Is, is, is that not that's airing right now? This is from, like, well, the recently. This is, like, season three right now airing, right? But I bet this is, like, older? tradition of royally screwing it up. Thankfully, Sword Art Online Abridged comes through for me yet again by taking what was a fairly standard, if decently paced, anime love story and turning it into a romance worth writing a video about. The, the romance in Abridged, from what I remember, is... How did it all start? She couldn't open the goddamn menu. We roasted her. She, she looked at Stone Kirito for a bit, and we drew something on her face. At a certain point, we started to mesh together, but even after, she's like, hey, we rushed into things. We can't be having this fucking kid. No, we gotta double them. We gotta have the kid, right? I don't know. The abridged romance is pretty fun. The relationship between Kurt and Ass is real, and it has a- My bad. Kurt and Ass. They got different names in this show, right? Clear and satisfying emotional arc that doesn't just feel like the inevitable result of having two main characters with different junk. Kurt and Ass might be terrible- Is that a cloister? To, you know, show asses pearls and, and onyx for Kirito's saber. Full, dysfunctional, borderline, psychopathic, and as Yui puts it, more a loose collection of character defects than people. But together, they're able to play off of each other's faults and create one yeah. of the most compelling portrayals of an adolescent romance that I've ever seen. In order to understand how these two people function as a unit, we need to understand how they function individually. Let's okay. start with Kurt. This is Kurt. When we're first introduced to Kurt, it's immediately apparent that he's a Fucking asshole. This yes. guy is experiencing the world's first full dive virtual MMO and it's- Wait, 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 wait. That's the hair of that fucking character from My Hero Academia, right? The blonde guy that yells a lot, right? So he's an asshole, yeah? Instead of questing or leveling or exploring, he Fuck spends you, the entire first day making fun of this guy for not being able to kill a pig with a rock. In addition to being a great joke, this is a very important character moment. Kurt isn't making fun of balls instead of enjoying the game. That is Kurt's way of enjoying the game. E Making fun of other noobs is his way of enjoying the game. Very edgy of you, Kurt. I mean, he's like a 14-year-old kid, right? Even IRL, MMORPGs are commonly seen as a kind of escapist wish fulfillment, where people who aren't satisfied with their lives can go to experience the kind of life they've always wanted to have. So isn't that a... Isn't that a... Way too true, huh? Way too true. MMOs are a way to escape your life because your life is so bleak and so dull and so depressing. So what do you do? You go play fucking World of Warcraft. You go play fucking Lost Ark. You replace your life with the virtual life where you get another fucking job. Games these days, straight up, just feels like another fucking job. Sometimes I'm grinding games in the beginning, it's fun, but it gets to a point where you're at the end game and there's a whole, you know, a streamlined workflow. You gotta clear these dungeons, you gotta do your dailies, you gotta get the weekly shit sorted out. And suddenly, you're there, grinding, thinking and asking to yourself, is this just another job that I fucking escaped to? What the fuck is going on? And then I stopped playing MMOs. At some point, the MMO allure, as you get older, you start to realize how pointless it is. And it's a very depressing, dystopian thing. I think on TikTok, they have a new trend where a person will be enjoying themselves, watching a movie, playing a game. And then suddenly they have this realization, and the caption is, when the frontal lobe finally develops. Basically, this part of your brain at a certain age, you start to realize that, you know, maybe society is creeping up 
I'm getting older. What have I really accomplished with my life? Should I get a better job? Should I be hustling right now? Should I make a fucking YouTube channel and watch anime so I can escape the 9 to 5 rats race? I don't fucking know, man. So, too, with Kurt. Kurt isn't just an asshole. He's the asshole he's always aspired to be. We start seeing this immediately after his pebble diatribe, when Balls responds to eight hours of mockery by saying, I have a feeling you get beat up a lot in real life, and Kurt shoots back, Shut up! Here I have power! In the 11th episode, Kurt admits that being trapped in SAO was a dream come true for him, since he was shoved around and treated like garbage in the real world. More Skill issue. More than anyone else in the series that we know about, Kurt is taking advantage of the escapist potential of a full dive MMO. But instead of using it to explore an exciting new world, we're gonna shit on the NPCs like balls deep. He's using it to correct a power disparity that he feels is unjust. Yeah. Additionally, Kurt honestly does believe that he's better than everyone else around him, and he's mostly right. During who is this guy? Uh, beside Kaiba and Balls Deep, we got Tiffany. I, 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 I know Sachi. Maybe this is Sachi. This is Yui. We got Liz Basilica. Who is this dude? Whose face is that? Is this some reference I'm not understanding? Is it one of the people that made SAO Bridged? Is it himself? I don't fucking know. During the final fight on floor 75, Kayaba sympathizes with Kurt, saying that they're both geniuses in a world that just can't keep up with them, and Kurt says that he's glad someone finally understands his pain. This sense of innate superiority. That's a very fun line. Uh, uh, not, not a fun line, but an interesting line. A lot of people that are like very smart, very intelligent, they'll often say, the masses simply cannot understand my genius. And maybe that is true. Maybe that is true. But then here's the question that I propose to those people, and maybe you have the same opinion too. If you're so goddamn smart, why can't you convince these fucking monkeys to like you? If you're so smart, it should be trivial. But why are you struggling? Because maybe you aren't actually that smart. Maybe you're just hiding behind this shell of armor, of pseudo-intellect, thinking you're better than everyone else. When at the end of the day, you're just the same. Coupled with his natural skill at the game and the extra experience that comes from being a beta tester makes it easy for Kurt to go mad with power guy. and dismiss everybody else in the game as useless pissants, as is clearly shown during his get good speech after the fight with Ilfang. But the catharsis that comes from exerting his power over others is shallow and doesn't satisfy him in any meaningful way. He may put on an arrogant tough guy persona, but that's mostly his way of dealing with the fact that he has no idea how to deal with the fact that he's now on the superior end of the social power disparity. What Kurt really wants is for people to legitimately like him, but since he's never been in this position before, he just shows off his skill feathers like some kind of strutting MMO peacock and hopes that everyone else bows to the king. Will never happen. You cannot gain the masses' appeal. You can't get people to like you by just like flexing on them. You need to be relatable, and Kurt, unfortunately, is not relatable. Case in point, have a look at this scene from the first episode, assuming I don't get content id would again. You may be the most unbearable asshole I've ever met, but you are really good at this game. We could use you in our group. What do you say? You can meet my friends, we'll form a guild, and have all these adventures. It'll be great! Nah. <laughs> Bye-bye. Well, screw you too! Think you're too good to join my guild? Think you're all cool because you know how to kill a boar? <laughs> there are two parts to Balls' comment. First is the I, I love I love Kurt's voice acting, bro. Whenever he goes Link start, when he starts crying stuff like that, the voice acting is actually pee. The unbearable asshole part, and second is the I don't mind you being an unbearable asshole because you're so good at this game part. If Kurt really were the self-righteous lion in a world of sheep that he claims to be, he would either jump at the chance to join a guild filled with weak players who would marvel at his giant sword True. cock, or he would think that Balls' offer was beneath him and mock him for it. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he runs off in tears because this person he spent the entire day making fun of called him an asshole. Balls' assessment of his character causes him to run away crying, but- <laughs> Bro really did spend the entire day, and then Balls Deep was like, damn, you don't have to be such a fucking asshole. He just actually starts to run away, fucking just crying, bawling his, air, his, his eyes out. He doesn't even seem to notice the second part of the statement, which is honestly a very high compliment to his gaming skill. Either that, or he runs off immediately following the unbearable asshole comment and doesn't even stick around for the second part, which says Most enough likely. in its own right. This desire to be liked is also displayed at the beginning of the second episode. That didn't bother the kid, none. He only cared about one thing, and one thing alone, himself. 
Because in a game of life or death, you either live or you die. True. Oh, wow. What brilliant insight. It's so deep, it loops right back around to being stupid. The kid ranted at no one. It slowly dawned just how alone he truly was. Breaking the fourth wall and the narrator shits at you back. This scene is important because the game itself is the one mocking him for being a friendless loser. This shows that no matter how good Kurt gets it sorted out online, he's never going to be the person he wants to be. <laughs> Who cares? I'm so alone. <laughs> be until he learns how to get people to stop thinking he's an arrogant cock goblin. Since he doesn't know how to do that, he puts up this asshole front to make it look like he's choosing to be alone because nobody else is good enough for him instead of just being ostracized by society for being an arrogant cock goblin. Enter ass. <laughs> Enter ass. What about you? Why haven't you joined the others? Oh, lots of reasons. Mostly because they're a bunch of mouth-breathing neckbeards who think LMAO is how French people laugh. <laughs> That's so lamau. <laughs> I think that joke would have been a lot funnier back in 2018. Yes, yes. Wow, you certainly speak from the heart. Funny, I thought I was speaking from my mouth, but eh, shows what I know about biology. No one else wanted you in their group, did they? Shut up, it was mutual! Ass is unique among the early cast of the series in that she immediately recognizes Kurt's facade. When Kurt runs away from Balls at the end of the first episode, Balls takes this as a personal attack, but Ass did understand immediately. She called him out on this bullshit. Responding, well, screw you too, think you're too good to join my guild. And during Taco Bell's death scene, he buys into Kurt's persona. Taco Bell's death scene. Diabel. Is there a Taco Bell menu called Diabel something? Is it like a Diabel taco once at the back, back in the fucking six years ago? Ona completely and wishes he could be more like him. Ass is the only one who implicitly understands that Kurt's allegedly voluntary isolation is a response to society's view of him and not the other way around. And the reason she's able to do this is because she is also putting on a front to get people to like her. She because she's actually a grand wizard. He's just better at it than Kurt. Ass is a full-fledged psychopath. Unlike yeah. Kurt, whose personage is mostly built around the idea of self-aggrandizement, Ass's is more about trying to pass as a moderately normal human being. Consider this exchange from the fifth episode. Okay, fine, God. Just want to prove I was right. There's no way that guy's really dead. There's something else going on here, and I'm going to prove it. Wow, how noble of you. Oh, spare me, Wonder Woman. You're only doing this to prove I was wrong. Hey, at least... I pretend to be nice to people! Yeah, Boom. whatever. Leaked. Wait, pretend? Here, Ass makes my job easy by unambiguously stating that any sense of outward friendliness she displays is a lie. There are two reasons for this, and strangely enough, they're the same two reasons that Kurt has for putting on his front. First, while Ass has had some social success, she does have experience with people shunning her once they get to know the quote-unquote real Ass. The Grand Wizard. This dislike slash fear of her is so bad that it gets to the point where two people are willing to jump out of windows in order to avoid being in the same room as her. So it makes... Well... Lisbeth... Lisbeth... No, Ass burned her fucking shop down. And Tiffany... You know... Tiffany's black. You know... Since she Asses, would do her best you know. to make sure that people see a version of her that doesn't make them want to jump out of windows. Second, Ass doesn't have the best life in the real world either. In the 10th episode- Tiffany's not black. Tiffany's Japanese. No. Could be a black person that is an immigrant in Japan and now lives in Japan. How does that work actually? Is Tiffany just really super tanned? I never questioned this. I thought Aegil was just a cool black bro. Just, just- Chilling in Japan, but then not, now that I think about it, it's like, hold up, was he ever black? Was he ever black? Is he just super tan? Isn't, isn't there a part of Japan where it's like they're always surfing and shit, Osaka or some place, right? And they're, they're, they're just always out on the beach and it's very sunny and <laughs> it could be super tan because of that. I don't, I don't fucking know anymore, actually. ...episode, when the two of them are dancing their beautiful, dysfunctional marriage tango, Ass's inner monologue states that her stubbornness comes from her mother, who told her to dig in her heels when she's wrong and never show weakness. The mom that we actually haven't seen yet in season one, part two. Why is that? We've seen Asuna's dad, but not the mom. She also says that her parents are getting divorced. Nothing against divorced parents. That makes a lot more sense. Parents, but that kind of attitude coupled with divorce-inducing levels of conflict suggests that her household growing up wasn't exactly... Also, this just kind of spoiled Asuna's mom. This is not a cartoon image. This is it's straight up just the fucking... Asuna's mom ripped from the episode that's being split in half. 
with Asuna's dad on the left side. Asuna's mom on the right side. Not that important, right? Not that important of a spoiler, but okay, she exists. Happy and functional. And that kind of familial situation, if it were bad enough, would understandably lead to her having the attitude that she does. And it's worth pointing out that that attitude is abusive, at least at first. This might be obvious, considering that she committed arson against a perceived romantic Elizabeth. rival, but it bears repeating because her implicit understanding of Kurt allows her to really dig her nails into his mind and make sure he sticks around. Kurt's PTSD after Sachi's death is the basis for for pretty much all of his decisions, and Ass knows that. He's afraid to get close to anyone for fear that they're just going to up and die on him again, so he's left in this state of semi-self-imposed lonesomeness that he can't get out of without opening himself up to pain. Ass is aware of this mental block and uses it as a tool to keep Kurt around, like she does in this scene. Look, I know you're not crazy about guilds after your last one's unfortunate breakup, but don't worry, okay? Unfortunate. I'm sure as hell not gonna die on you like that dumb bitch Sally. Sachi. Sachi. Shh, shh. It doesn't matter. She's, She's dead, dead now. now. She cheer up, okay? Hmm, now that I think about it, this scene really was Asuna just grooming Kirito, who was so shocked and traumatized on Sachi. This abusive Asuna, who's seen the abuse in her own family household because of the divorces now, learned all these sociopathic traits. Now she's a fucking menace. Not only is she a grand wizard, she continues to groom. Also, there's the whole dynamic of like, is Kitty too younger or not, right? There's like a, there's a little bit like a running gag in the abridge of like, okay, Asuna is a racist and she seems to be grooming a quote unquote minor. She's a minor as well, but you know, it's a one year age gap, but. It was always funny, before we knew her actual age, of like, how old is she really? I bet she's fucking 35. I, I bet the 35-year-old's fucking grooming a fucking 14-year-old kid right now. I promise, things are gonna be better this time. Here, Ass does two things. First, she undercuts Kurt's emotional attachment to another woman in order to make sure that he never forgets that she is the main bitch in this situation and that any side chicks he's thinking about are gonna wake up charbroiled. Second, she reminds him of what he initially respected about her in the first place, the fact that she is so good at video games that she will never die. Are we watching the same anime? Isn't this the bitch that didn't know how to open a fucking menu? India Bridge might be different. No, in the Brits, it was specifically because of the menu. But in the anime, uh, proper, Asuna was like agile, right? There was a moment against the um, first floor dungeon boss where, where Asuna was fighting. Kirito was like, whoa, she's so precise and fast. In doing so, Ass is able to simultaneously comfort her romantic partner, convince him that his emotional investment in her isn't misplaced, and assert her dominance as the number one yandere bitch. But Ass isn't just number one yandere bitch. She's a yandere racist bitch. She's number one yandere bitch because she's afraid. Whenever she gets vaguely close to some- Afraid? Are there moments of vulnerability of her insecureness? Buddy, it's- <laughs> I didn't say anything, I swear! <laughs> Wait for me, I know a shortcut! <laughs> Basically that. So now that she has somebody who's willing to stick around, she wants to do everything she can to make sure he sticks around. And the best part is that Kurt is receptive to it. His compounding insecurities lead him to believe that he's basically unlikable, and that having any kind of emotional investment in other people just isn't worth it. So naturally, he's willing to go along with somebody whose compounding insecurities cause her to be aggressively affectionate, especially since he doesn't have to worry about her getting her ass kicked by slaughter knots and murder golems. After all, what he initially respected about ass was that she was able to hold her own in the first boss fight despite not knowing how to open the damn menu. True. He sees her as a naturally talented leet who might be able to actually keep up with him if given the chance. And their first kiss happens immediately after this brilliant line from Kurt that sums up everything he feels about her in two words. Ah, you bitch. <laughs> I know this sounds sarcastic, but here- Huh, that ah, you bitch, I never really took that seriously. But there is a level of deep codependence between Ass and Kurt in the abridged. Just like the theme of Snafu that I've been stalling because goddamn season 3 is so fucking depressing. Goddamn. This codependency between the boy and the girl. Kurt and Ass. It all makes sense. And the ah you bitch part, meaning Kirito kind of does know. Hear me out. Right before this scene, Kuridil says this exact line when Ass stabs him and immediately follows it up with, You know, people always think that being called a bitch is so negative, but frankly, I just think it shows how you're strong and confident and absolutely fucking terrifying, please don't kill me. Strong and confident and absolutely fucking terrifying, please don't kill me is- That's, that's Ass. Is exactly how Kurt feels about yeah. Ass. God, I, I can't even maintain my composure. This is so good. It's so good. This is how you're right, people. This is how you're right. And then there's... Bro is just fiercely masturbating 
just breaking down this fan-made fucking abridged version of this shitty anime known as Sword Art Online. Honestly, respect. It's cool to see someone very passionate about things that you may not be so interested in. And I'm sure you guys in chat right now, y'all are fucking dead. Y'all are snoozing. You got the fucking video muted because you're like, when is the next anime action reaction going to actually happen? But I think it's pretty cool when people are so ambitious, so passionate about some, some specific niche hobby that you might not be into, but some people actually love it. It's their life. Because they're actual romantic interactions. The way these two cluelessly fumble around each other with no idea what they're supposed to be doing is perfect because this is a teenage romance. Young adult characters in anime often exist in this kind of nebulous space where they're always as mature as they need to be, and I swore I wouldn't bring up SAO proper in this video, but it's a great point of comparison, so fuck the system. The romance between Kirito and Asuna is... okay. I think it actually makes a lot of sense, right? The moment I realized that, wait a minute, these are just two horny dumb kids stuck in a fucking video game where it could be life or death. So you can't ex expect them to be like fully functioning adults, right? You can't expect them to be mature all the time. I feel like their romance displayed in the show, there's a lot of flaws, a lot of faults, but that's to be expected. In fact, that makes it realistic. Now, the point that Asuna, like how Asuna fell in love with Kirito, I feel like that is still at the end of the day, Pretty forced, right? I would have to rewatch the episodes again to get a gauge on exactly when it started to happen. But I feel like the turning point was when Kirito actually was near like death scenario, right? There was a fight against the Gleam Eyes, but then it also got carried over against the Corradial incident where Kirito was almost at zero HP. And Asuna both times was just like so worried and so vulnerable. And she actually opens up and Kirito opens up too. At that point, that was sealed. But the things that leads up to it, they did party up together in episode two or one, right? To beat the first episode two. There were some wholesome moments of, you know, sharing sandwich. There's some Sundere moments where she's telling Kirito, what the fuck are you napping? But aside from that, I just never really felt like, well, then again, some people were like, yo, they're just dumb, horny kids. And I'm like, you know what? Kirito's like pretty good looking, you know? It's like, bro's the fucking, you know, anime main character look, right? And Asuna's, Probably just another dumb horny kid. So her, you know, simping for Kirito because he looks good. Makes sense to me, especially if he's so strong. And there's a lot of time skip. And the fact that the anime also doesn't cover as much as a light novel, right? Because a light novel, I'm sure, portrays a lot more details and fleshes out the romance on how it started and how it develops. I'm sure the anime only touches it on a little bit, right? But I felt like their romance, aside from how it started, I felt like it made a lot of sense. It's not bad. There are some cute moments and some cringeworthy dialogue, and overall, it's fine. If you went and didn't come back, I would kill myself. Was that cringe? At that point, I was like, I mean, Kirito even had to fucking make a promise to Kaiba to say, like, don't make sure, like, Asuna can't kill herself because that's how much she cares about me. I thought that was like, and it was like a dark, a really important moment where we're finally going back into the dungeon after having a vacation, right? I guess if you kind of like, step back and really assess the dialogue and it's like he went and didn't come back i would kill myself it would seem kind of cringe but again if you uh, if you see it from the lens of an emotionally charged like 17 16 year old where it's again the life or death situation and they're in love I think it makes sense. But what really annoyed me was how mature the whole thing was. These kids are 16 <laughs> Okay, we're on episode 21 on Patreon on Twitch right now, as SAO. There's an episode where Asna or Titania finds the hidden lab and tries to escape Alfheim online. And there's these two slugs. And what do you see over here? What? Can you guys read this? Right over here? Mature, 17 plus. Blood and gore. Intense violence. Strong language. Slug. And are already happily and effectively married with a daughter who they are totally capable of raising And you can say that teenagers are typically happier together, which is fair But they don't act like teenagers in that respect either No weird pet names, no constant contact And I can't confirm this, but it doesn't I would kill myself if Asta started to call Kirito Kitty Kitty Little ass face is funny I will be satisfied until we're the same person. Seem like they're fucking three times a day on every surface of their cottage. It's just a perfectly normal relationship, and I can't speak for you all, but I know that I never had a perfectly normal relationship like this when I was 16, or 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I've only seen three anime- A little bit too personal. But again, I just feel like their relationship shown in the show, even if it was messy, is very realistic. Because teenage romance is very messy, very troubled, 
both sides don't even know what they fucking want. They're just acting out of their own impulses driven by teenage hormones. I think it makes sense. Hey, that portray teen romance well. Evangelion, Sound Euphonium, and SAO Abridged. And up Real? Only these three, huh? You got two animes. You got, you got one of the greatest of the goats of anime, Evangelion. We got the fucking trombone anime, what season 3 is airing right now, which seems to be just fucking Yuri bait, and people are gonna be like, No, it's not Yuri bait, it's amazing! Okay, I, I bet it's good, I bet it's good, but come on, like, come on, let's, there's, there's, it's Yuri. And then you got SAO Abridge. No other show? No other show has good romance? I felt like, what about Bunny Girl Senpai? I felt like the main character, and my... It was refreshing how, how much of a gig, well... Again, we're talking about... We're talking about, like, realistic teenage romance. Bunny Girl Senpai, that's not very realistic. The guy was such a giga chat. Like, there's no fucking normal 16-year-old, 15-year-old fucking student in high school that acts like that. Yeah, we're, lo we're looking for realistic, messy, believable teen romance. We're not thinking about perfect fucking romance created in a vacuum where, again, as this guy said, where the character as are as mature as they need to be at specific points and toned down when they're not, right? Of those three, SAO Abridged is the best one that I'm going to be talking about at length in this video. The way Kurt's sexuality is expressed is perfect, not just because Got replaced he's a teenage by the boy, but also specifically for his character. Just like Kurt puts on the overconfident, too cool for school persona for society at large, he also presents himself as a worldly James Bond type around hashtag the ladies. Specifically ass when he starts talking about the hashtag dubious implications of her having him over late at night. And when mm. ass reveals everything, Kurt's... Pussy ass bitch, James Bond would never make these noises. But a horny 15-year-old kid probably would. The right reaction for somebody yeah. whose whole experience with sex comes from dating sims. And the way the series portrays Ass's <laughs> relationship with her sexuality is brilliant too. She's confident and able to go after what she wants, which is consistent with her yandere personality. Racist. But she also uses sex as a tool in her manipulation of Kurt. And That's a fucking... Look at this tool, dude. Balls. Shaft. Head. As demonstrated when he suggests that getting married was the worst mistake of their lives and she shuts him up with her mouth. And don't even get me started on the whole post-sex debacle. Their ignorance about how their relationship is supposed to proceed after sex, followed by a grand romantic gesture that neither of them really wants but that they both accept out of pure stubbornness and an unwillingness to admit defeat is the most adolescent thing I- That's exactly. It's, it's very believable. You know how they kept doubling down? How many times have you seen a relationship where it's like, not even in this show, but like, in real life, I'm not sure, like, I come from a pretty redneck town, okay? I was the only Asian kid in my high school. I come from, like, the entirety of my school, which is a bunch of fucking rednecks, right? Not a bad thing. They were, they were nice. They were nice, you know? They'd be like, ah, oh, you want to fucking get some noodles? You're Asian, right? You love noodles. And it's like, I know you mean well. Just kind of comes off wrong. Anyways, what would also happen is a lot of early teen pregnancies based off of Terrible made decisions from relationships that should have never happened. But what usually happens is when you get in a relationship and things are messy and people don't know what they're doing, instead of backing out, some people fucking double down. When they're unhappy in a relationship, sometimes they're like, you know what? You know what's going to solve our fucking problems? A fucking kid. Let's double down and have a kid. And in fact, they specifically mentioned this in the, in the Abridged episode too, right? We even talk about going to the fucking orphanage. Not getting one kid, multiple kids, right? I have ever seen in anime. And what really brings it home is how the whole thing is resolved. Instead of blowing up in their faces or escalating to the point of absolute madness before one or both of them finally breaks down and admits defeat, they go through some serious emotional trauma together and emerge as stronger and more mature people who are Rest finally peace, able Club to Penguin. have a grown-up conversation about the future of their relationship, which ends with them realizing how stupid they were to have their little romantic dick measuring contest yep. in the first place. Which brings me to everyone's favorite kawaii AI daughteru, Yui. The most important thing about Yui is that she is a perfect fit for this family because of this line right here. I am sorry I lied to you. I inserted myself into your lives merely to satisfy my own curiosity. Important line. At least, at first. And now? It was... Nice to be a part of your family. No, All Yui! Ten, both Kurt and Ass use Yui as a tool to try to get the other one to be the first to admit that their marriage is a sham. But the reason this is brilliant is because Yui is using them as well. This is how Yui is able to have such a profound effect on them. Well, we see some of their parental instincts. 
Yui also, well, Yui was an AI in the proper unabridged, where she was supposed to be like a mental therapist, but then she broke down seeing the trauma of other people, and then she saw the semblance of love and peace in Kurt and Ass, and she wanted to be a part of it, right? But she was using them, just like how Ass and Kurt are also kind of using Yui, and maybe themselves to justify their bad decisions until one of them gives up, okay? Things start to kick in just from being around her, i.e. Kurt being impressed with her verbal takedown of Yulier and Ass calling her an adorable little troglodyte. What really causes the two of them to change and mature is seeing themselves reflected in Yui. Just like them, Yui is a manipulator who is using them to achieve her own goals, namely learning about love. But the reason she has such a huge impact is because despite initially using Kurt and Ass to her own ends, Yui selflessly risks being deleted to save them from the dollar store blow up skeleton man oh. seeing someone as manipulative as dollar store blow up skeleton man wasn't this like a super important fucking scythe monster that i don't know we couldn't even fucking beat but he pretty much does look like it they are risk death to save the people they're manipulating makes both of them realize what sociopathic idiots they've been an ass in particular falls over and wails in anguish at yui's death showing off some really impressive voice work from bubble monkey Huh. That's, that's Finally, her voice let's actor? talk about their last moments together. While the two of them are sitting up in heaven watching the world burn, just like they've always wanted, we get a few very satisfying and legitimately touching moments. First, they share their real names. For two people who have spent the entire series putting up walls and acting out personas, the fact that the series ends with the two of them being comfortable enough to share their real selves with each other is very poignant. Se but it's funny because Asuna's real name was just... Her fucking real name. Second is how their last conversation starts with Ass berating Kurt for crying and continues with her making little jabs at him for thinking he can build a robot body for Yui. Their relationship dynamic is mostly built on playfully poking fun at each other. And to see her lightly mock him at such a serious moment while they're both crying and smiling is really beautiful because it further displays the level of comfort they've achieved with each other. Hmm. And the playful nature of the insults shows how far they've come from the much harsher and more biting mockery of their first few episodes together. And and lastly, Ass's last words to Kurt demonstrate that she's fully managed to get past his barriers and is able to understand him implicitly without having to be told what he's feeling. Kurt seriously tells her that he loves her for the first time, and she pulls a Han Solo and says, I know, meaning that for- She didn't say I love you back, right? She did say I know, and at that point I was like, ooh, Asna's definitely the one that wears the pants in this relationship. For all the problems and conflicts they have, for all the posturing and emotional trauma, she is able to see the real him and she likes what she sees okay i do have more that i could say about sao abridge but i think that two videos is enough for now i am moving into a new apartment so i'll save the next one for when i break something and need to pay my congratulations for those of you who missed my sick rap at the end of my how to are, 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 are you done are you done I check the screen go back and redo it with someone who puts out a giga i feel like there is no point for me to watch this last part because you guys just want me to watch the SEO bridge to review. And this last part is a little bit more community memes that I'm not going to be able to understand at worst. At best, I'm going to be able to sit here and just kind of just sit here in cringe silence and just say, wow, nice rap. But that's it from me. Honestly, I never really thought too deep of this series. I thought that uh, it was a fun abridged comedy, a quote unquote deconstruction as if I find out what a deconstruction means, a satire on the show that we're watching right now, SAO. And sometimes a bridge, I think, definitely does shine above the SAO proper, right? I, I think a lot of people agree with that opinion, too. And honestly, it's a, good, it's a very good video. It puts a lot of in-depth analysis while I'm just a fucking monkey just laughing and just you know, yelling bald into the screen whenever someone bald shows up. But it's cool to see, like, breaking down each individual components. And in this part, it was more about the love the teenage romance between Kirito and Asuna, or Kurt and Ass, and I think it was in a bridge and SAO proper, I think it was done pretty decently well. I think that the whole uh, relationships are messy, specifically teenage romance, and the fact that these characters are supposed to be flawed, horny, dumb kids stuck in a game where it's life or death, making these mistakes, but still coming out on top. I think the way they portrayed it in a bridge specifically was very beautiful. That's it from me. All right, we got to watch more bridge episodes because we are so behind.